Thank you, Karen. So first, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the support that my colleagues and I have had for this research. Um, first of all, from the Volkswagen Stiftung and grant on into the glass mind, bringing together cognitive scientists, evolutionary anthropologists, philosophers, and an architect to examine the issues of glass. Uh, EU Marie Curie Fellowship to Achille Pasqualato, and uh, EPSRC grant, Design Patterns for Inclusive Collaboration, uh, supporting the work in my lab, which includes some work that I'm not going to be discussing here, um, but something that was brought up yesterday in response to uh, Linquist's wonderful presentation about some of the multisensory aspects of architecture and the study of visually impaired persons for getting to understand that. And that's sensory substitution devices, which are devices, uh, like an example shown over here, that allow you to translate information that normally would be perceived visually into something another sense can process, such as into sound or into touch. And so these form assistive devices for the visually impaired that we work with. And I haven't used, uh, in particular, a device called the voice for that sort of work. Now, one thing that got me really excited about coming to this meeting, uh, besides the fact that I work with this sort of interdisciplinary group of people coming from various backgrounds and discovering that there's actually a meeting designed for bringing those sorts of people together, um, was some of the past things that have been discussed um, at AMFA, including a work by the founding president, Eberhard, that here on the website noted a number of examples that really exemplify how building design should keep in mind that they're dealing with a multi-sensory creature. That oftentimes, designers can just focus on the visual aspects of design. And of course, I suppose award juries probably focus on that quite a bit too. But in fact, there are all the other senses that contribute quite a lot to how we experience a space and how we use a space. And so I thought these examples were perfect. And so I decided I wanted to provide some other examples from the work we're doing to not only provide this concept of using the multi-sensory perspective to design buildings, but also to take on a perspective of spatial reference frames. And this is an issue that came up earlier in the session on wayfinding. And so a lot of these topics come up again and again. But now I want you to think about these spatial reference frames also in terms of the senses that we use to gain knowledge about the space via these different spatial reference frames. And so for this, I'm going to be talking about parapersonal versus extrapersonal space. And there's an example here in this figure where you'll see a person sort of exploring parapersonal space, which is essentially that space that's within arm's reach. And then beyond that, you have extrapersonal space. And so that will be regions of space that normally you gain information from, either by vision, by sound, if there's something that makes noise, or by moving towards that space with proprioception in order to gain more information about it. And a couple of other spatial reference frames I'll talk about are egocentric versus allocentric, which you heard a little bit about earlier. And again, the egocentric is thinking about sort of self-centered spatial reference frames. So thinking about the location of things in relation to the self and where you've actually experienced something, which is similar to building up a route for finding your way through some space. And allocentric, or having some sort of other centered representation that comes about through the relationship of the locations of other objects or things in a scene, which allows you either to take on another perspective within the scene, or even build up something like a map-like representation of a scene. And so one of the first projects we're looking at, led by Alexandra de Souza in our group, is to look at the parapersonal space. And in the context of dealing with sort of a paradoxical material like glass, which is a transparent barrier, which in a sense seems to cut you off from the space beyond. But of course, when you're dealing with vision, you can see through that barrier and you can still perceive things there. And so something might be on the other side of it, such as if you're on, say, the tube in London, you might have a glass there that gives you some space between the air person pressed up against it on the other side. But the fact that you can see through it might sort of bring them still within your personal space. 
And the way we're currently examining this is with an fMRI study looking at analogous regions such as this defensive face region in the Galagos, which is in human parietal cortex, so an area that's multisensory and sort of at the point between perception, sensation on one side, and action on the other side. And in this past work, for example, you find that activity in this face defensive region responds to looming objects with an immediate response to protect the face as it comes close. And so we're going to be looking at this in the context of having something similar to a glass barrier, here shown with a mesh, where the items will be approaching the person, and they're either on the opposite side of the barrier, where the barrier should protect you from them, or they're on the same side of the barrier as you, and then perhaps you have to defend yourself in some way so this uh, goat doesn't hit you in the face. But in moving beyond the parapersonal space to the extrapersonal space, um, this other example from Eberhard focused on proprioception um, is a really good thing to think about because when you design a space, people aren't going to just look at it, but they're going to move through it somehow to interact with that space. And so proprioception is often the main sense we use to gain that knowledge about a space and to learn where things are in that space. And so some of the ways we examine that in our lab is by currently setting up fairly small scale spaces where people have to learn what is where in a small room. And so in some of the classic work with sighted individuals, you'd have a person stand down here at the bottom facing first the banana here, and they would have to remember each of the objects in the scene and try to remember where they are. So that way when they're later tested, you can assess the mental representation they have of those locations. And so if you want to see what that would be like to be tested, you can imagine yourself in this building and think of yourself standing where the sandwiches were at the table. Now face towards the registration desk and try to point towards this room. Does anyone want to try and point their arm in some direction? Most people are pointing kind of in this direction as they imagine that heading. Some are pointed the other way. And it shows a sort of a challenge to imagine yourself within a space and have to shift the reference frame you might be using. But that's a way you can get an idea of what sort of mental reference frame people are using as they remember where things are. And in this classic work where people did this just with vision, um, you first could test just to see if they're using an egocentric reference frame which will be based on the one they actually experienced. This is the angle from which they actually viewed the objects. What's fascinating is with sighted individuals, it turns out they're better at using an imagined heading they never experienced. So they're using an allocentric spatial reference frame. And the reason they're doing that is that if you notice, if you imagine this heading coming from the side, all the objects fall into nice columns and rows. And so there, it makes it easier to remember what is where in this setting if you can take on that allocentric perspective. So even though people didn't actually see it from the angle, they perform better. So what we did is we wanted to see how proprioception and touch could be used to acquire information and to see what sort of spatial reference frames people would use relying only on those senses. So first of all, we blindfolded sighted people, moved them from the bottom here, sort of by the banana, to each object, one after the other. So they would go towards, say, the scissors, back to the starting point, go up to the banana, back to the starting point, one after another. So they're working from this perspective of starting at the bottom of the image here. And then when we tested them later, what we found is that their performance was still better from this allocentric perspective that they never experienced. So keep in mind, they're blindfolded. And so they never actually see the structure of the items, but they pick up on it anyways. Now what's fascinating is we also looked at late blind individuals. So those who had some visual experience early in life and became blind at a later point, and they had the exact same pattern of results. However, when we looked at congenitally blind individuals, we found the opposite pattern of results. And instead, they had better performance when we asked them to imagine headings from that egocentric perspective, from the actual starting point they used. And so they didn't seem to take on 
this allocentric perspective like those who had had visual experience tend to do. And once we knew the results, we went back to our participants and asked them about this. Many of them said it seemed to be consistent with the way they orient the world. So when they are faced with a wayfinding problem, they often think of things in terms of routes. And so they build up multiple routes to get where they're going rather than just using a single map-like representation. And so in some ways, some even describe that if they're given a braille map of an area, like a new train station, it's sort of an awkward representation to use because they don't think about going through a space as from above, but rather the routes they physically take to go through it. So in this work, we also wanted to tie back to some of that neuroscience work we're doing with these um, parietal face regions for how people deal with things visually, but again, to get at understanding how visual experience might be necessary for the development of those brain regions. And so for this work, in our collaboration with Marty, we wanted to look at a particular human parietal face region, um, coincidentally called VIP, except this time instead of being for visually impaired people, it's the ventral intraparietal area. And for this, what Marty had found in some past work is a nice alignment between where you see things out in space and where you feel touches on your face. And so just like that Galago monkey might sort of put a hand up to block something that's looming towards it, humans, of course, would want to do the same thing. If you see like a ball coming, you'd want to be able to put your hand up and protect that region that would otherwise be touched by it. Now, in this work, though, it's unclear whether there's something innate about this, because it seems fairly important to be able to protect yourself from looming things, or whether some sort of sensory experience helps build up this representation. And so we looked at this, again, with sighted individuals, late-blind individuals, and congenitally blind individuals. And just to give some examples from the results that we have, here comparing a congenitally blind participant on top with a late-blind participant on the bottom. And if you look in particular at the area of VIP, shown near the top here in each image, you'll notice in the late-blind participant, we have results here that look very similar to what you see in the sighted. And that is the different colors here correspond to the different polar regions of the face that are stimulated by little air puffs that move around the face. And we find this representation of the whole face is very similar to the representation you see in sighted individuals. However, if you look here at the congenitally blind participant, you'll notice we have hardly any response at all in this region to the feeling of the touches on the face. And the only activity we have here corresponds to the bottom of the face. And so what's interesting is, first of all, this shows that visual experience is necessary for developing the representation of touch in the face that you see aligning with visual experience, the retinotopic maps that happen in sighted individuals. But also it's interesting to see that the areas of the face that are represented correspond to the way the congenitally blind often interact with the world. So as they're getting to know parapersonal space through touch, most of that information is going to be down below, so the bottom part of the face. And if they're even extending their parapersonal space through the use of a white cane into extrapersonal space, so actually having sort of an extension of their body and expanding their parapersonal space, once again, that's all in the lower regions, which correspond more with the lower part of their face. So there seems to be something saving that activity uh, in this face parietal region. And so, Overall, as we think about these results, it gives us some idea of what vision is for. So going back to some of Eberhard's examples about how it's important to think about the other senses, so that doesn't only happen with architects, of course, where it, you might overemphasize the visual aspects of things, but we in psychology and neuroscience do that as well, where we often think of the brain as being largely visual. Um, a lot of people like to quote how the brain is about 50% visually responsive in primates. But even if you look at primary visual cortex, so the primary sensory area for vision, neurons in that area actually respond to touch and to sound as well. And so there's something much more multisensory about the whole brain rather than just being sort of visually dominant in primates. But vision does have its purposes. 
It allows you to pick up on that extra personal silent information. And in many ways, that allows it to mediate between the senses, to integrate them and process them together. And as a result, co cognition in the congenitally blind changes in the absence of that spatial and multi-sensory tuning that vision can provide. If you see, hear, smell something happening, vision can help tie together all those experiences. And without that, that might change the sorts of cognitive strategies people use. And so, in conclusion, spatial reference frames underlie how our senses interact with space, including buildings. We've worked on a small scale so far, but we want to expand that. Um, visual impairment is something that, mirroring again the talk by Lindquist yesterday, is important because if you work with visually impaired people, it helps you focus on those non-visual aspects of the building. You have individuals who, if you have consult and co-design with you, are experts on using their other senses. And so they can pick up on those things that you might not pick up on. And also, it can help you build to be inclusive rather than just accessible. So rather than just sort of making changes after the fact to make the building accessible to people with sensory or physical impairments, if you have those people co-designing with you early on, those VIPs, for example, can tell you that the ceiling's too low and it's oppressive, for example. And you might not otherwise pick up on that. And in future work with this team, um, with Alexandra de Souza as our uh, evolutionary anthropologist, uh, Gazina Marcotte as our architect, and Amanda Taylor Aiken as our philosopher, we're hoping to examine this in a project called Way and Self, Navigation, Ability, Environment, and Embodiment, um, which we're interviewing for in a couple of weeks, to try and expand this out to much greater scales in terms of the built environment, and again using these VIPs to help us understand that space. And finally, if you want to learn more, um, I have my old abstract in the book. So if you want a copy of the extended abstract with the references, it's available at this link here. Thank you.